Hello everyone and welcome to lecture number four, the nervous system. Now in this lecture I will go over um, just very broadly some of the anatomy, the terms, we'll get into some of the physiology of course, but you're going to see that throughout this, this course that I'm going to be bringing up more and more parts of the nervous system more specifically as it uh, pertains to some of the, the systems in particular. Um, and I will have more lectures at the at the end of the semester to kind of go into some of the more details in terms of, of pathways and whatnot. So this is a, uh, this can be considered really just more of a, a, an overview, if you will. Now to start, actually, I, I've included this little picture here, and some of you may know what this is if you have any neural background. But this is we're looking at a drawing of the hippocampus, and this drawing was actually done by a very famous man named uh, Santiago Ramoni Cajal. And uh, he was actually a neuroanatomist who sketched out different neurons throughout the brain and was one of the first people to help come up with what we call the neuron doctrine. In other words, you know, before his time, uh, we didn't know that the nervous system was made up of you know, individual cells. And so he was able to draw them out in, you know, in pretty astonishing detail. So to begin, again, this is very broad, but we, we take the nervous system and we really divide it into uh, you know, two components or two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, now, the central nervous system is just the, the brain and the spinal cord, okay, which you can see there in the cartoon. And the peripheral nervous system is everything outside of the brain and spinal cord. And so, for example, in the peripheral nervous system, otherwise labeled as the, the PNS there, is the cranial nerves. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. All right. You have the spinal nerves, which you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And you can see that that's colored there in, in the, the yellow strands that you're seeing. The ganglia, ganglia are located in the peripheral nervous system. And uh, they could be, you know, for holding sensory uh, neuron bodies. Or, you know, it could be part of the autonomic nervous system. And we'll get to that in that specific lecture. And there's also part of the what we call the enteric plexus, which is part of the digestive system. And when we talk about the GI, we'll get more into the enteric nervous system at that time. And of course, you know, any any sensory receptors that are in the skin, we have different types of receptors to help us pick up on different types of sensation. But all in all, that's all part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so let's talk about the brain, which is part of the central nervous system. And we take a look at this cartoon. What you're looking at here is a sagittal section of the brain. And just so you, so you know, the sagittal section is actually any section that separates the right side of the body from the left side of the body. And it can be taken anywhere across the, uh, the body, as long as it's separating left from right. If it's taken directly in the middle through the brain like this, we call it a mid-sagittal section. And so that's what we're looking at in this cart cartoon right here is a mid-sagittal section of the, the brain where we can actually look at the internal structures of the brain there. And, you know, the first thing you're going to notice as we work away from top to bottom here is this outer structure called the cerebrum, all right, the cerebral cortex. And you'll notice that it has all these involutions, right? So you have uh, you know, sulci and gyri. And so I actually like to compare this to the, the mitochondria over here in the sense that if you look at the outer membrane of the mitochondria and you look at the internal membrane there, the inner membrane, You'll notice that the inner membrane is actually all involuted and folded up too. And one of the functions that that serves is to increase surface area to allow more reactions to occur across that membrane. You may see this type of pattern a lot in anatomy. Okay, For example, in the lungs, you also have increased surface area. And now it may not look exactly like that, but the, the idea is it helps to allow for more, more interactions, more diffusion of gases, for example, in the lungs. Okay. Uh, helps with uh, production of more uh, ATP in the mitochondria. In the brain, it has a confined space in the skull. These involutions may actually allow for um, for us to contain more neurons and more pathways and so on. So it may serve one, one purpose to increase the surface area. It also helps to designate anatomical sections of the cerebrum. Because in point of fact, uh, that cerebrum will have very specific designated lobes on it that carry out specific functions. Right. So, for example, you have uh, frontal lobes, parietal lobes, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and each of these lobes have specific neurons that can carry out specific functions. Right. And that's something you're going to kind of see with the, with the nervous system in general, is that it has a very organized system to it. 
Okay, I mean, it may look chaotic to us at first until we kind of learn how it all operates, but it's very well organized. Okay, and again, those those types of functions you see in the cerebrum might be things like uh, decision making or emotion, uh, perception of uh, sensation, control of motor movements, vision, memory, and, and a host of other things that it can carry out. A lot of these, you know, higher order functions that we have. If we go a little bit deeper below the cerebrum, you can see this sort of white matter structure right here called the corpus callosum. It helps to connect the two halves of our brain, all right, to the left and right hemisphere. Just beneath that, you can see here, this is the thalamus, and that kind of looks like the pit, like a pit of like a, you know, a peach or something like that. You have the pit, and um, that really uh, is sort of like a relay center, if you will. Since we're in New York, I'll use uh, the analogy of Grand Central, all right, where, you know, a lot of nerves are coming in there, and then what happens is the thalamus will then tell it where to go to go to the correct destination from there to the cerebrum. Okay, so it kind of funnels in a lot of information coming up from the spinal cord and sends it to the appropriate place uh, in the cerebrum, for example. Just sort of below and anterior to it, you have this structure here, which is the hypothalamus, and connected to that is the pituitary gland. And we have a whole separate lecture on the endocrine system, but this is sort of the connection between the uh, the, neur the neurons in the endocrine system, so it's our neuroendocrine axis, which we'll get more into later. Over here, you can see the cerebellum, all right, it's the posterior structure, which is just behind or posterior to here, the brain stem, which has three parts to it, okay, you have the midbrain at the top, it's a small segment up there, then you have the pons, which has a sort of bulbous region right there, and then this, the, uh, the medulla oblongata, which is just below that, and then continuous below the, the medulla oblongata would be the uh, spinal cord inferior to that. In terms of the cerebellum, you can conceive even anatomically that its structure is different from the cerebrum, and it would be able to help us carry out things like fine-tuning our, our motor movement. For example, learning how to ride a bike, tying our shoes, things that might just require some sort of motor memory. Uh, the cerebellum would be very uh, useful for that. Okay. In terms of development, this is actually a sort of a clinical correlate where you can see here the in the normal. All right, so this is my normal, and in this image, this this image is actually what we call a horizontal section. So you can imagine if we're looking at this, it's like a section up here above the eyes. Okay, it's a section that's horizontal. And so you can see the sort of the anterior portion of the brain. Here's the posterior, okay. And as we're looking at it, you can see all the, the gyri around the periphery, okay. You can see these sulci too, which are these invaginations that you can see, all right, which again could increase the surface area of our, our brain. Uh, this structure over here are the ventricles, which are fluid filled with cerebral spinal fluid. All right, now if we take a look over here, this condition is called lysencephaly. And you can clearly see the difference in, in the brains here, but this is a developmental disorder where during development, the neurons are actually supposed to migrate outward from the central portions of the brain out to the more peripheral portions uh, where it would help to signal and create these uh, invaginations and create the gyri and the sulci and so on. And you'll notice that there are none here. It's very smooth in appearance. And this comes, of course, with several defects, one being, you know, they're very prone to seizures developmental disorders, and unfortunately, usually a very short lifespan. You can also see here these very enlarged uh, ventricles. So the spinal cord. So the spinal cord, of course, is inferior to the brain. And so if you're looking here, here's the skull. At just the base of the skull, you have the foramen magnum. All right, so again, remember, just the most inferior structure in the brain it's going to be the brain stem. So that's the medulla oblongata. And as it exits through the foramen magnum, uh, as soon as it exits the foramen magnum, it's, con it's considered uh, the spinal cord. And the spinal cord, as you can see, descends all through the posterior region between the vertebrae, the bony structures that protect it, the vertebral column there. And so that, of course, descends. And you can see that at every level, remember with the vertebrae, it's segmented, right? And we have uh, cervical vertebrae and thoracic vertebrae, and they're all jointed so that we're able to mobilize, right? It's not just a rigid pipe. And you'll notice that the spinal cord, as it's protected by that bony structure, uh, it also gives off nerves 
on either side. So you have, again, 31 spinal nerves, we call it. Okay? Now, those spinal nerves, you can see it exits to the left and right at each level. So like you have, for example, cervical nerves, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and even a coccygeal nerves. All right? And they'll, again, exit left and right, so you have pairs of them. Okay? We'll come back to that, but if you look closely here in this section over here, the spinal cord, you can see that you can see the bony uh, portions here, which is surrounded. Okay, that's part of the vertebrae. That's been cut, so we can see the spinal cord. And then you see attached to the spinal cord are the nerve roots. So the part that actually connects to the spinal cord itself is the nerve root. And then you see the actual spinal nerve on either side here. Okay. And over here is again in this cartoon here, you can see there is a section here. You'll see here. This is again the, the roots. So you have the what we call a ventral root. So here's a ventral root right there. This is a dorsal root over here. And again, here's the ventral root and here's the dorsal root. And so they connect to the ventral side and the dorsal side of the spinal cord. You'll notice that they come together at this point here. And in fact, the point where it's exiting, and I'll draw it over here, the point where it's exiting the vertebral column there. So when the, both the ventral and the dorsal root come together, and then it leaves the, at that point where it comes together, is actually leaving the vertebral column there through the intervertebral foramen. All right, so the intervertebral foramen is where the ventral and the posterior or the ventral and the dorsal root come together. Okay, so what I'm going to do for you right now is I'm going to draw spinal cord. So bear with me for just a moment as I draw this. Hopefully it will kind of come together. You'll be able to kind of see what I'm going for. That would be good. Okay, so with the spinal cord, I've just drawn a cross section of a portion of the spinal cord. All right, and I want to label it first. So these are the roots. So this would be the ventral root. Ventral root. Over here would be the dorsal root. And remember, the roots are what attaches to the spinal cord itself, and it's within the uh, spinal column or the vertebral column. And this over here, where they've come together, is called the spinal nerve. All right. Now, you'll notice I drew kind of like in the section of the spinal cord, I drew what looks like an H shape or, you know, or, you know a butterfly type shape in the, in the center there. And so this is the anterior horn which is right here, and then there's the posterior horn, which is right here, on either side. And oftentimes, anatomically, when we look at a cross-section of the spinal cord, we have to kind of imagine that it's divided in half. So I'll draw a little dotted line here that's kind of divided in half into a left side and a right side, one that's sort of exiting from one side to the other. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw a particular neuron right now in red. Okay. Now in the dorsal root, you'll notice that I, I drew a little bulge in the dorsal root. Okay. That bulge right there is called a ganglion. So this specifically is called a dorsal root ganglion. I'm going to put DRG for dorsal root ganglion. You can see another one over here, which is a dorsal root ganglion. Now the dorsal root ganglion houses uh, cell bodies, which we'll get we'll get to in the next couple of slides. Now the dorsal root, all right, not only is it uh, an anatomic structure, but it carries specifically sensory information from the periphery of the body towards the spinal cord. So that little red line that I just drew there, 
represents a neuron. There's a neuron cell body, which is this little circle that I drew right there, which is connected to this sort of long dendrite and axon, so to speak. So the sensation occurs out here, so I'll put sensation. All right, that's a sensory neuron. And there would be thousands of them, of course, and we're just drawing the one. Don't have enough time for that. So we have sensation, and that would travel back towards the spinal cord, and ultimately it would go enter into the spinal cord, and depending on the type of sensation it would have, it would travel up the spinal cord to the brain where we could then perceive that sensation, whatever the sensation happens to be. Now in the ventral horn, we would have, I'm going to draw a little cell body that looks like a triangle over here, but this is a neuron cell body located in the anterior horn, okay, of the spinal cord. And it would give out an axon that travels this way. All right. So I drew it in blue. And this blue neuron that I just drew, which I just lost, and this blue neuron would be a motor neuron. And you notice that the motor is going to command things like movement, for example, or stimulate a gland to secrete something. And so those cell bodies are located in that anterior horn. And the axon then exits the ventral root. So it enters the ventral root and enters the spinal nerve to ultimately synapse or connect with a, you know, a muscle or a gland or something like that. Whereas sensation, which is in red, is going the opposite direction. It's coming from the body back towards the spinal cord to the brain. In the motor, is coming from the brain to the spinal cord out to the body. So we have two separate directions of movement. And the importance here anatomically and physiologically is that we have a separation here in the roots where the dorsal root is carrying sensory information only. The ventral root is carrying motor information only. Now that's helpful both because um, you know, anatomically, we know now that there's a separation, but also clinically, it's important for us to know. For example, if I had a lesion, let's say I had a, a herniated disc or something of that nature, right? Where uh, it's impinging the ventral root. So I'm just going to draw a big X through the ventral root there, meaning it's completely obstructed that it's, it's crushed it, let's say. So that there's no signal coming from that ventral root. That means Anything that's trying to be uh, that, that's innervated by that portion of the spinal cord there, any muscle or gland that's innervated by it, will not receive any input because it's being blocked by whatever obstruction is there. However, sensory to that area of the body would be totally intact because the dorsal root is intact. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of that X for a second. It is the same thing if I were to say if it was impinging the dorsal root. Now, the motor portion of it would be totally normal, but now it's specifically lost sensation. And these are things that we could actually test for clinically, is to look for changes in sensation versus changes in, say, strength, for example. And that would give us clinical information as to, you know, where the lesion might be before we even have to do any type of imaging. And of course, last, you probably guessed at this point, but if I put an X through the spinal nerve itself, that would be mixed because it's carrying both sensation as well as motor, so you could have a sort of a mixed picture there. Okay. Okay, just so we're clear, I didn't draw it on the uh, one side of the spinal cord, but it would be the same. It would mirror each other, so it would be the same uh, anatomical properties. Dorsal root carrying sensory only, ventral root carrying uh, motor commands only. All right, so a little bit more about the spinal cord. Uh, as I mentioned, there's 31 pairs of them, and you have eight cervical, which you can see drawn out for you in the cartoon here. So there's the eight cervical, so you can see C8 right there. You have 12 thoracic, you have five lumbar, so here's the 12th thoracic in blue, here's the fifth lumbar. You have five sacral, so there's S5, and then you have a coccygeal nerve down here, which is there's only one up. Okay. Now, um, You'll also notice something else here. If we take a look at the spinal cord, the length of the spinal cord only reaches to this point right here called the conus medullaris, which if you look at the vertebral column, all right, or the, the vertebrae there, you'll see which one it actually coincides with, is between L1 and L2. 
So the, uh, the spinal cord actually terminates or ends at the level of L1, L2. It does not go the entire distance of your vertebral column. It does not go to the sacrum. Now the reason that it stops there is it's really a developmental because uh, when you know in early development they actually matched each other in length. So the spinal cord went the entire distance all the way towards the, the uh, cossacks. However, as you develop, the vertebral column itself outpaces the, the nervous system there, and it grows more, and so it ends up being longer than the spinal than the spinal cord itself. And so this is, you know, again, clinically useful to know that the spinal cord ends at L1, L2, especially if you're going into neuro. Uh, you'll know that doing uh, spinal taps, for example, or lumbar punctures, it's called. When you stick the needle in there to get CSF or cerebral spinal fluid, you want to make sure you go, be go below the level of L1, L2 to avoid hitting the spinal cord. Okay. Now, uh, in addition to that, we have what we call functional areas of the spinal cord. Even though it's one continuous mass from the time it leaves the foramen, uh, from the start from the foramen magnum all the way to L1, uh, it can functionally be divided. So you can see it's been color coded. So in green would be the cervical portion of the spinal cord, okay? And the cervical portion, C1 through C8, would actually serve the upper extremities of the body. So it would coincide mostly with the, the region that it's in. So uh, we call it the cervical enlargement. It's an enlargement that again serves primarily sort of the upper extremities. Then you have the blue area, which is the thoracic area, which would then again be the thoracic region. So the organs of the thorax as well as the wall. Uh, the wall of the thorax. Then you have the lumbar region. Okay, so in the lumbar region, you can see there's another enlargement, and that enlargement coincides with the lower extremities. So this is going to be where we're innovating the lower extremities again. And then you can see the sacrum portion there in red at the bottom. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that the cervical and thoracic regions of the spinal cord coincide pretty closely with the vertebral level. However, you'll notice that right around T11 here, we really started the lumbar portion of the spinal cord already. Remember, it's the functional portion. So it's going to have to give off roots, but you'll notice its roots have to be longer to exit at its respective levels. So here's L1 right here. Let me use a different color to make this a little bit easier. Let me rid of some of this. So here is the L1, and you'll notice that nerve, here's the L1 vertebrae, in order for it to exit at its respective level, it has to have a long root so it can exit there. And those roots get longer and longer because the spinal cord ends at L1 or L2, which means in order for it to exit at the appropriate level of, say, S1 or S2, those roots have to be exceedingly long to reach all the way down there to exit at the appropriate place. And so what ends up happening is you have these very long nerve roots that kind of look like a horse's tail. And that's what they called it. So they call it the, the cauda equina, right? So equine sports have to do with horses, right? So this is the cauda equina. And so it looks like a horse's tail that's hanging off the bottom of the, the spinal cord there. So now I want to go into a few terms that are going to help make things easier, hopefully not only in my course, but also other courses that you're going to take possibly in, you know, in neuro. So we have gray, what we call gray versus white matter. Now, white matter in the central nervous system is predominantly myelinated and also some unmyelinated axons, but what makes it white is the fatty content of the myelin itself, which we discussed in the previous lecture, made by Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. And so since it has a high fatty content, it actually looks like white matter. And you can see here in the spinal cord section, so that's right here, that the white matter is actually in the periphery. It's out here. That's the white matter. Centrally, where there's that H or that butterfly shape that I drew for you previously, that is gray matter. Gray matter primarily contains neuronal cell bodies. That's where the cell bodies are located, the dendrites are located, as well as unmyelinated axons and something called neuroglial cells, which we'll talk about in a, in a slide to come up. All right. So gray matter has the cell bodies and their dendrites primarily, and the white matter is going to be the axons, which are primarily going to be you know, a mixture of myelinated and unmyelinated axons. Now, in the cross-section of the spinal cord, you'll notice the gray matter is centrally located. When we get to the brain, however, it switches. There's a sort of reversed, right? You see the gray matter is actually peripheral. 
So in the cortex there, you see it's all along the periphery. All right. You may have some, as you can see over here, you may have some islands of gray. In this case, it kind of looks like a Wi-Fi signal. But this is actually this, these islands of gray there, all right, are nuclei. So they're located kind of like surrounded by white matter, uh, which gives it that kind of island type appearance. Uh, so these are what we refer to as nuclei. So for example, those are part of the, what we call the basal nuclei. And so a nucleus is a bundle of neuronal cell bodies in the, in the central nervous system. Not to be mistaken for the nucleus of a cell, okay? It's not the same thing. When we're referring to uh, anatomical structures of the nervous system, we say that there's a nuclei. That's referring to neuronal cell bodies, a cluster of them, that happen to be surrounded by white matter. So it creates like that island look effect. We refer to that as a nucleus. The basal nuclei used to be called basal ganglia. Now it's been changed to nuclei. All right, so any gray matter surrounded by white matter, we refer to as a nucleus. Just to kind of show you here, white versus gray matter. Uh, on an autopsy, as you can see in the picture to the, to the left there, as he's making slices in it, this just hasn't been dyed or altered in any way. Okay, and you'll, and you'll notice the white matter here. Okay, the reason it looks white, I mean, that's what they saw when they actually did the autopsy, when it, when it looks white because of the fatty content. All right, the lipid content of the of the myelin, which would surround the axons, of course. And then you can see the, the gray matter along the edges there, okay? And so that would be where these cell bodies are located with their dendrites and so on. If we take a look at the image of the MRI over there to the, to the right of it, now in this particular uh, MRI imaging, you can see this is a uh, coronal section. And a coronal section, coronal meaning like a crown, and actually, these sections separate anterior from posterior structures. So it separates anterior from posterior uh, structures, which is separate from sagittal, which separates left from right side. So this section is a coronal section. And what you can see here uh, is you see the white matter in the center, and you see the gray matter all along the edges, and you can even see our little Wi-Fi sign there, or that's uh, those nuclei there. In fact, you can see over here, this is part of the uh, thalamus, and then you can see here, this region right there, uh, that's the, the ventricle. Those are the lateral ventricles. The fluid looks uh, blackish. Okay, now um, I mentioned in an earlier slide that uh, the brain is structured in such a way that it's highly organized, right? The different lobes have different functions and so on. In the spinal cord, it's the same. In fact, throughout the entire nervous system, it's actually very well organized. And so in the spinal cord, if you look at this section here, kind of like the one that I, I drew, all right, you can see the, uh, the, the central gray area and the white, the white matter around it. And you can see over here, this is the dorsal root, here's the ventral root, here's the ganglion over here, the bulge in the dorsal root. Okay, so that's carrying sensory information, the ventral is carrying the, the motor, okay. Now what I'm trying to show you here is sort of some of the regions and how they've kind of been separated out, how these axons, that are carrying either sensory information or they're carrying motor information are, are actually traveling in discrete regions in the spinal cord. Now one of the spinal cord's you know, primary jobs is to act as sort of a, a relay between the body and the brain. So anything that's happening in the body, any kind of sensory uh, information, we need to relay that to the brain so the spinal cord helps to carry it there and it does so in an organized fashion. Okay, and of course, if the brain has to tell the body to do anything, it has to go through the spinal cord in order to, to do that. Now, the spinal cord is much more complex than just a relay. Uh, it does carry out reflexes and integrates information as well. Uh, but one of its primaries, again, is just this relay. Now, you'll notice there's ascending and descending tracks. Now, that's not specific to one half of the spinal cord versus the other. In fact, descending tracks are found in both the left and right halves of the spinal cord, and so are ascending tracks. Just for clarity's sake, they've separated them here. So understand that they'd be on both sides. Uh, so that you can see the ascending tracks, that would be sensory information colored in red, and it would follow these sort of discrete colored areas that they're showing you here, going back to the brain. Now, that would be different types of sensation would follow maybe uh, different paths, and they would be like bundles of axons traveling together with a similar function. Okay, so it is organized. And then in the green over here, those green designated areas, again, would be found on both sides, would be carrying, you know, motor information from the brain to carry out a certain process, like secretion from a gland or skeletal muscle contraction, for example.
And so that would be following discrete um, regions, okay, based on whatever the function happens to be or what it's supposedly going to signal. And so with these axons that are traveling together in these discrete regions of the spinal cord, we refer to the path that they're following as a tract. So I call it a bundle of axons as a tract. And you'll notice that's exactly what they call them. So you don't have to memorize all these names right now, all right? But just understand that these, these different regions have specific names, and they call them tracks. And they would have, again, discrete functions uh, associated with them. Now, bundles of axons that are located in the peripheral nerves, in the peripheral nervous system, again, that would be out here. So like, there's one of our uh, peripheral nerves. That's a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. So depending on whether we're in the central versus the peripheral nervous system, we give it a different name. If the axons are traveling together in the central nervous system, we, recall, we refer to that as a tract. If the axons of neurons are traveling together, uh, they're, they're bundled together in the peripheral nervous system, we refer to that as a nerve. And understand it's an important point to make now that a nerve is not the same thing as a neuron. A neuron is an individual cell. A nerve is a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, And I should also point out that in the peripheral nervous system, just like in the central nervous system, the central nervous system we have gray matter, which is where we have clusters of cell bodies, and we keep everything nice and organized that way. The peripheral nervous system is no exception. We don't have cell bodies all over the place. In fact, they're clustered in very specific regions in the periphery. Those regions are called ganglia. Anytime you see a ganglia, like the dorsal root ganglia that we have went over, that contains this, the neuron cell bodies. Everything else all right, outside of the ganglia in the periphery is considered a nerve because it's just axons that are traveling there. So here's the ganglia, what it would look like. So in the periphery, if, I, if there's a cluster of cell bodies, all right, that cluster of cell bodies, if we're looking at the dorsal root, for example, here's a cross section through the dorsal root, and you can see how all these cell bodies here, these are all cell bodies in here. They're all jam-packed in there, and you'll, you'll notice how they're all connected to their axons, which are out here which looks like this very fine, you know, like angel hair pasta hair, all right, is, is traveling through there, okay? So those nerves carry the axons. The ganglion will also have axons going through them because they have to travel through them, but that's where the cell bodies will be clustered together. And so ganglions are only located in the peripheral nervous system, all right? The cluster of cell bodies in the central is a nucleus. Now, we also uh, functionally classify neurons. So we classify them as afferent or efferent. I emphasize uh, the A or the E specifically so I don't get confused with my pronunciation. Afferent and efferent sound very close. All right, so an afferent, emphasizing the A here, all right, this is actually where neurons are carrying information towards the central nervous system, so towards the spinal cord, towards the brain, okay? They're considered afferent, all right? Now, most of the afferent neurons that we'll talk about are what we call unipolar, and I'll show you an example of what a unipolar uh, neuron is, but it's based on its, um, its structure. Um, these are sensory, right? This is how we pick up and interact with our environment. We have some type of sensation, like touch, vibration, pain, or something like that, okay, temperature, and that would send information so that we can process that elicit a reflex through the spinal cord or go to the brain so we can, you know, take our hand away from a hot stove or understand the textures and so on. So those are afferent. They're bringing information too. Now, just in brief though, you'll, you'll notice down here is a crossing through the uh, cross section of the spinal cord. And these are receptors for, again, uh, sensation. All right. Now you'll notice that here, there's the dorsal root ganglion. That's where the cell body is located for that sensory neuron. It goes through the dorsal root and then it ascends or ascends the spinal cord towards the brain and here's the cross section to the medulla so we've ascended all the way to the brain stem the lowest portion of the brain stem and it synapses it makes a connection with another neuron at that point and then it crosses over it goes from that side of the, uh, the brain stem over to the other side of the brain stem and it follows a particular tract okay all the way up to the thalamus where it synapses again and that last neuron is going to go to the cortex, and in this case, since it's sensation, it goes to what we call the, you know, uh, postcentral gyrus, which is 
you know, our somatosensory, for example, where we can process that sensory input. All right. We'll get more into that pathway later, but this is just so you can see the general pattern. The other one is the efferent. Okay, and I say efferent, okay, to emphasize the E there, which is essentially like it's exiting from the central nervous system. We're going from the brain, spinal cord, out to the periphery. All right, this is commonly, this is what the motor neurons do, and most, many of the motor neurons that we're going to discuss are what we call multipolar, and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, and motor axons descend into the spinal cord. So you can see we start, instead we, we do the reverse. We start up here in the cortex, all right, so be more like in the frontal lobe, like precentral gyrus. So we're in the, the, the frontal lobe there, and we want to command the body to move or muscle to contract, for example. And that's going to send the axons down all the way through the brainstem. So you can see here down to the, the bottommost portion of the brainstem. And then you'll notice over here we have some crossing over that takes place, or what we refer to as decusation. All right. So that occurs in the medulla. Like most of them, not all, but most of those fibers are going to cross over there. And then they're going to synapse in that anterior horn where there's another cell body waiting for them. At which point all the fibers, so let's say, uh, I'm going to point out these guys over here. So these neurons, let me erase this for a second. We circle these ones up here in the cortex. They've come over, they crossed over in the medulla, and now, since the cartoon is demonstrating it on that side, they're now on the opposite side of the spinal cord in that anterior horn, and those cell bodies are going to send their axons out through the ventral horn, or ventral root, excuse me, which I mentioned before. And that ventral root will then go out to the periphery of the body to then synapse with a skeletal muscle or a, or a gland, okay? Now you'll notice that's crossover. That means that, again, we have crossover with both sensory and motor. So therefore, keep in mind that, so let's say the left side of the brain would control the movement of the right side of the body. And then vice versa. And then, of course, sensation coming from the right side of the, uh, the body would then ultimately synapse and go to the left side of the brain. All right. What we'll learn about later on is, of course, where these, we'll learn more about the specifics of these pathways, where they cross over, because all of that will um, be very relevant clinically. All right. And so the last one, we have the afferent, the efferent, and we also have something referred to as an inter- an interneuron or an association neuron. These are located within the central nervous system. Okay, so it's in the CNS, and this actually helps to process incoming sensory information, um, and it can help to elicit a motor response. So it helps to uh, integrate information that's coming into the spinal cord, and you can see that it's kind of car you know a little cartoon has been drawn here. So if we have let's say our dendrites that are uh, picking up our various sensations, let's say touch for example. So this is an afferent neuron. There's the cell body which will be located in the ganglion. In this case it will be the dorsal root ganglion. It goes in through the dorsal horn and the spinal cord and you'll notice it's connecting with or synapsing with uh, this green neuron which is an interneuron. That interneuron can then immediately connect to a motor neuron. The motor neuron of course is located in the, uh, the anterior horn there and leaves ventrally through the ventral root and then goes out, again this is an efferent neuron, then goes to the effector, a muscle or a gland, right? And so this interneuron is connecting the sensory to the motor. Now what you're not seeing here, which would add complexity to this, is that sensory, not only would it synapse, let's say, with that interneuron, but it would also send, it would branch and also go up towards the brain so we can process that information. Okay, so of course it has to go to the brain so we can process all sensory inputs. But there's a shortcut here to an interneuron that connects it with one or more than one motor outputs. This is very useful for th carrying out things like reflexes, for instance. So in terms of reflexes, all right, we'll talk sort of in general about reflexes and again come to more details later on uh, as we move through the semester. But a reflex is a fast, predictable, automatic response to changes in the environment. All right, we have many, many reflexes, okay? So in terms of peripheral reflexes, like reflexes that we commonly think about in our limbs, for example, like I'm sure we've all been to the doctor's office where they checked our, our knee reflex, the knee jerk reflex, okay? Which is our patellar tendon reflex, where they strike it with the hammer and we kick out, okay? That is one reflex, right? But we have so many different reflexes and they serve a function is to protect our bodies, protect the internal environment of our bodies. For example, the reflex of pulling your hand away from a hot stove, 
we do it very quickly, and that's a reflex action. We didn't have time to process that and think about you know, how our hand is burning and then take it away because at that point, the damage has been done. So the reflex helps to make sure we protect ourselves so it doesn't take as much time to process it and then make a move. That way it saves us from too much damage. And this is one, of course, one, one of the reasons we have reflexes. All right, same thing if we, in this example here, you see in the cartoon, there's you know painful stimulus, stepped on attack or something sharp, or as my case with my daughter, stepping on a Lego, just like the worst thing ever. You step on these sharp things, right? You get that pain, it goes immediately into the dorsal root. You can see the cell body there. And yes, a portion of it will ascend so that I can perceive the fact that I stepped on a Lego, for example. But to get my foot off of it even quicker, it's going to synapse on this little purple guy, or this purple neuron, which is my interneuron, which will connect me immediately to a motor. And then the motor neuron will then give the output to the muscles here and coordinate the muscle movements appropriately so that I can make the appropriate movement of like, let's say, lifting my foot or lifting my leg, okay? And so that's, that's the, the reflex arc. And I also put in red here, kind of highlighted here, that this would be an ipsilateral, for example, reflex. And I call it ipsilateral because the reflex stays entirely on one side of the spinal cord. In some cases with more complex reflexes, some of those reflexes can actually cross over to the other side of the spinal cord to elicit motor responses or something of that nature on the, other, on the opposite side. So for example, let's say going back to stepping on a, a Lego, if I step on the Lego with my right foot, my first uh, reflex reaction of course would be to lift my, you know, my, lift my right leg off of the Lego. And so what it's going to do is it's going to activate my hip flexors and it's going to activate you know, my quads and my hamstrings. And it's going to appropriately inhibit certain muscles so that they're looser and contract others, right? So because we have <coughs> excuse me, agonist and antagonist muscles, and so we have to appropriately make sure we antagonize and, and activate the appropriate muscles to make the movement occur. So I'm lifting my leg, but that's not going to be good enough because I also have to tell my other leg, which is still on the ground, to stabilize. Otherwise, if I lift the leg and I'm in a sort of precarious position, I might fall over onto a pile of Legos and that's even worse. So I lift my leg and I have part of the reflex would be to cross over to the cross over the spinal cord and now it would be what we call contralateral because it's going to the opposite side of the spinal cord and it's telling the muscles of that leg to steady and stiffen up so that I can maintain my balance and hold hold myself up. All right, so that would be where you'd see crossover, where it's not entirely ipsilateral reflex, it has a contralateral component to it. So the spinal cord, again, not only is it transmitting this, you know, communications between the brain and the, and the, the body, but it's also going to integrate these, these reflex reactions. And beyond the reflexes of the spinal cord, don't forget, as we'll, you guys will learn more in neuro, but we have other reflexes like pupillary light reflexes, for example. Okay, or we even have uh, reflexes for uh, for when you know you need to sit upright. Okay, uh, so I'm assuming if you guys are sitting upright right now, your head's not down on the keyboard. Okay, but if you're upright right now, you're not thinking the whole time about staying upright. Okay, your body, your postural muscles are adjusting automatically. And we're not thinking about that, and that's communication between those mu postural muscles and your brain, and that's that's all reflex reaction based on the position of your body it'll readjust and it does that automatically in addition uh, to our you know ipsilateral and contralateral reflexes and so on we also have something we call monosynaptic and polysynaptic reflexes and all that means is how many synapses are, are formed for to complete the reflex arc so the reflex arc is everything from the sensation to the motor output okay if it only takes the two neurons so for example over here this is the, the knee jerk reflex, right? Where the hammer strikes the, the patellar tendon. That causes a stretch sensation in the muscle. Okay, and that stretch receptor then sends that sensation through the dorsal root, right? Here's my dorsal root, into the spinal cord, and it synapses directly onto the motor. There is no interneuron here. It goes right to the, uh, uh, to the motor neuron, and then there's an output, which is to contract the quadricep. And so that's why the foot kicked out. We call that monosynaptic because there's only one synapse between the sensory and the motor neuron, which is the one I circled right here in the spinal cord. Polysynaptic just means it's going to have you know, an interneuron in there.
So instead, like let's say the, the, the one I mentioned before, like having your hand on a hot stove or burning your hand on a Bunsen burner, I guess, where you know you get that sensation, that travels in through the dorsal root and it synapses instead on an interneuron. That interneuron then connects to the motor neuron. And then that motor process would be to, again, contract the bicep to lift the hand away from the, uh, the flame. Okay, so that's, that's polysynaptic. And the last bit I want to talk about on the reflexes is how this kind of relates clinically because we all know that we've had reflexes done before and um, in neurology you'll learn more about this in depth. But there's something called a, a dermatome. And a dermatome is really just the distribution of the sensory neurons to the skin. So for example, the nerves, the sensory nerves that innervates, say, around the nipple area here, you can see here is T4, okay? That just means that the nerves associated with the T4 level of the spinal cord, okay, will innervate that region of the body right around the nipples. Or here at T10, all right, the nerves that are associated with the T10 region of the spinal cord are right around the umbilicus and so on. So, for example, if let's say we do reflexes, we usually do it in multiple parts of the body, right? Like in the upper extremities and the lower extremities. And that gives us a good idea of how intact the nerves are in connection with the spinal cord. So as a brief example, if I have L4, which is right here, okay, you see the L4 dermatome, how it's distributed uh, along, obliquely along the leg there, on the anterior aspect of the leg. The L4, of course, is going to... Um, be coming from the L4 vertebrae where the nerves are, are coming in or going out. So if I strike the, the knee there, the patellar tendon, I'm really activating the L4 sensory region. So the sensation that's going to come back is going to be the sensory neuron that's going to go back to the spinal cord at the L4 level. And it'll create the reflex. The output from there is going to come back from the L3, L4 to cause contraction of the quadricep. So it helps me to actually identify regions of the spinal cord that might be impacted. Let's say if somebody had a motor vehicle accident and had spinal injury, I could check the patellar tendons on both sides. You always check both sides for symmetry. And I could do other multiple reflexes, and that would give me information about how intact you know, you know, that connection might be at that particular level of the spinal cord, especially if somebody's complaining of lower back pain uh, and they're having uh, you know, sensory loss or something like that, their reflexes might also be affected. Now again, as I mentioned, the, the spinal cord itself is one continuous mass, but functionally we divide it up and it coincides with the nerves that, uh, that interact with it. Okay, so it can be functionally sort of divided up uh, we can see that anatomically as well by the roots, where the roots connect with the spinal cord. All right. So, for example, here in this cartoon, we might be looking, let's say this is L1, the L1 nerves on either side. So you can see that over here and over here. Let's say those are the L1 nerves. And let's say this is the L2 functional segment. All right. So this would coincide with the L2 nerves over here, peripheral nerves. All right. And that would be for all the segments, so the C1 all the way to the coccygeal nerve. All right, we have what we call that functional designation, which anatomically are kind of indicated by where the nerve roots connect with the spinal cord. And so you would have the afferents. Let me get the a color here. The afferents would be coming in this way and traveling upward. And I'll put the little cell body in the ganglia in there. All right, so one of its jobs is to enter into the dorsal, head up towards the the brain so we can perceive it but as I mentioned before it might also give off a branch over here and connect with let's say a motor neuron that's located right there in the ventral horn which can then exit ventrally and head out towards the body to innervate the skeletal muscle or a gland all right so the sensory neuron depending on what that sensation is right uh, that will, you know, usually divide, that axon can divide and it can connect with the motor and, and be part of a reflex um, as well as send that information upward. So it can integrate that into a reflex or give us our, our perceptual um, image of what that sensation hit was. Um, now at the same time, the motor, the motor can also be directly from the brain down telling us to, to move a certain limb, but it's also interacting with the sensory and the interneurons so it can also integrate reflexes and that's all part of the nature of it and as we'll learn later on in the 
uh, the later lectures, when we sort of delve more into these pathways, depending on the sensation type, it'll take certain tracks or pathways in the spinal cord, as I kind of alluded to in the earlier slides. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about that because there'll be differences between, say, where pain travels versus where touch or vibration will travel in the spinal cord okay, and how it can interact and inter uh, uh, and sort of play a, play a role in reflexes and so on. And then again, I kind of already went to this, but the motor efferents, those will stimulate, you know, voluntary movement, of course, and also participate in a reflex, as I've mentioned. All right, so this slide should look familiar. We actually went over this once already, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, I want to kind of go into some of the different types of neurons that there are. Uh, I mentioned it on a previous slide. So the neurons, again, primarily we're talking about like motor, sensory, and interneurons. And so in, in this case, you can see, again, it's a general type of neuron. And you see the cell body, which I've labeled there as the soma. You see the dendrites, which are you know, the ways which you can, uh, other neurons can communicate with it and picks up that information. And then there's the axon hillock, where the action potential is generated, sends that down the axon, which, again, the axons can be myelinated or unmyelinated. And the, you know, the action potentials themselves will travel faster in the myelinated and go from the, you know, one node to another. And then at the very end, we have the axon terminal or the, the synaptic end bulbs. Now, I had kind of already talked about some of the, the structure in the previous slides, but I hadn't gone into any real detail on it. So when I talked about afferent or efferent being unipolar or multipolar, for example. So here, there's really three broad classifications that you have. The first one is here, the multipolar neuron. All right. Then you have what we call the bipolar neuron, and then the unipolar, or sometimes referred to as a pseudo-unipolar neuron. So let's start with the multipolar. First off, if I want to know uh, whether it's multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar, or why they name it as such, it's based on how many neuronal processes are coming off of the cell body itself. So take the middle one, for example, bipolar neuron. So here's the cell body or the soma, and it has this process, -y. all right, there's one right here coming off of it, and then another one coming off of it right here. Now, one's a dendrite, one's an axon, we're just calling them neuronal processes, but you see one on either side, that's two coming off the cell body, so it's a bipolar neuron, okay, one coming off of either side. The unipolar, you'll notice it only has one connection to its cell body, so therefore we call it unipolar, all right? The term pseudo-unipolar came from the fact that during development it may have started out uh, being you know, more bipolar and then transitioned into a unipolar type uh, picture. But either way, this has one connection, so therefore it is a unipolar. Multipolar, here's the cell body. So on the previous slide was an example of this. The cell body has a whole bunch of different dendrites coming off of different parts of the, the soma itself, as well as the axon. Um, so they call it a multipolar neuron. Multipolar neurons are, are quite common in the brain. It's not the only type, of course, but it's quite common. And you can see here, you know, that's why I have a picture of the brain down beneath that. The bipolar, where you'd find those neurons, are things like in the, the retina, for example. And so you actually what you're looking at is the ophthalmoscope vision. Uh, you're looking at the back of the eye there. And the pseudo-unipolar. Pseudo-unipolar is actually the main type of neuron for our peripheral sensations. And that's what I've been drawing in those dorsal root ganglions is a pseudo-unipolar that looks somewhat like this, where I draw the cell body, a little line there, and I draw it like that. All right, so that's a pseudo-unipolar, so that's for our peripheral sensations. So the neuronal processes that are really, you know, they're emanating from the cell body there. I like to say they come in different flavors. It's basically the different arrangements of their dendrites, uh, and their structure really helps to kind of carry out their specific type of function. So as an example, you have the uh, Purkinje cells. Purkinje cells, you can see their axon here divides many times, so it can synapse with you know, multiple different neurons, for example. And it's, it's dendritic arborization, or branching pattern, looks like that. And you can actually see that in the, the Golgi stain here. You can kind of see that process. You might see that in like, the cerebellum. Okay? The pyramidal cell, pyramidal because it has a pyramidal shape, type shape to it. Okay, you notice its dendritic arborization is, is much different in its structure and it's dependent on its different type of function. And you see pyramidal cells, for example, in the hippocampus where memories can be formed and so on. Uh, in fact, over here, this was right here, you can kind of see a little bit of the, 
This would be my pyramidal cell right here. This is actually a picture that I took from my lab uh, back when I was working at uh, New York Medical College. And this over here is just an artifact. Okay, this is actually my pipette, which was filled with a dye. And I injected that dye into the, the pyramidal cell body there. When I injected it, you can actually see the dendrites there. And it kind of looks like the cartoon that you have there. And you can see the axon down here. Now, I did mention in a previous slide the neuroglia as being uh, cells that can be found in the gray matter. And uh, the neuroglia, you know, actually translates to, you know, glue. So it's, you know, the, the neuron glue. And it was actually thought of at the time when it was first discovered that uh, these cells probably operated more or less uh, to kind of keep the brain together like a glue and keep the neurons in, uh, together. And that really the whole story was the neurons. As we're learning more and more about the nervous system, uh, we're, we're also learning more and more about the neuroglia and how it plays an absolutely vital role. And in fact, they're more numerous than the neurons themselves. And uh, so there's various types and they carry out different types of functions. One type, for example, is the astrocyte. So the astrocyte, kind of like astro, like a star, it's kind of like a star-shaped, and you can see it over here, right? Uh, a star-shaped type neuron. And you'll see it gives off many processes. And so these processes interact with the neuron itself. So these are neurons, okay? So they, it goes over and interacts with the neurons. And it, it plays a role in, in, in helping to uh, regulate the neuron. And uh, it may even help to regulate uh, electrolyte balances with the neuron and so on. But you also notice some of the processes are also covering the blood vessel. And so those processes can actually contribute to something referred to as the blood-brain barrier. And we talked about that in you know, an earlier lecture. All right, so, so it can contribute to the blood-brain barrier. And in fact, in the staining down here, you can actually see one of the astrocytes, and you can see one of the processes here is, that's going towards a blood vessel. So this is a blood vessel down here. And that blood vessel all right, uh, is covered by these processes of the astrocyte, which contribute again to that blood-brain barrier. Then there's these ependymal cells, and the ependymal cells are these cells right here. And these cells can be found lining the ventricles within the brain. So the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, and so on. These help to uh, produce, in some cases, produce the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, And so that would be the cerebral spinal fluid out here. So it would be like in the, one of the ventricles, for example. Then you have oligodendrocytes, which we mentioned already, which help to myelinate. Uh, the axons and speed up conduction time. And then over here you have our resonant immune cells or the microglia help to kind of fend off infections and so on. All right, now back to the neurons. Uh, the neurons connect with each other via synapses, as I've already been mentioning. All right, and the synapse is just a junction between two neurons uh, or between a neuron and an effector cell, some type like a gland, for example. And there's really two types of uh, synapses that can form in the body. You have what we have called an electrical synapse. So an electrical synapse means that the two cells are bound via what we call a gap junction. All right, and a gap junction is a protein that connects the cell membranes of two different cells together, and it has uh, a channel in it so that the cytoplasm is directly connected from one cell to the next that can communicate between those two cells. This allows for very, very fast transmission of electrical current. This is something we're going to see a lot of when we discuss, for instance, uh, electrical conduction through the heart. Cardiac myocytes are connected to each other via gap junctions. And this is very useful if you want, say, synchronized electrical activity because as one cell, say, fires an action potential, that will transmit that signal very rapidly through a host of cells that it's connected to. Okay, And that would, in essence, make all those cells act in unison to contract which is something that's a useful feature in the heart where you would want that. Um, now, the chemical synapses is primarily what you're going to find in our, in our nervous system. And this is where we transfer information from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron via a neurotransmitter or a chemical compound that actually has to cross through a space in order to interact with the, the surface of the, the cell. So they're not directly bound to one another. So what you're seeing here in the cartoon is a chemical synapse. And we have our presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron. Those are relative terms. It just means that the presynaptic communicates with the postsynaptic. 
if I had another cell over here, all right, then this cell right here would then be presynaptic relative to this cell right here, which would then be postsynaptic and so on. So it's relative to its position to another neuron, okay? So this cartoon is really just showing you that this is a, it's a very simplified drawing. This is the soma, there's the axon, and then you see the synapse there. It's over, so overly simple, but this is to, to kind of help illustrate the point here. So if, for example, this neuron right here were to fire an action potential, that would propagate down the action potential to the synapse, wherein it would then release a chemical, right, a neurotransmitter like glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, uh, and so on. And so that, chem that chemical would have to travel across the synapse and then bind to a receptor. And then the receptor would elicit a response in the postsynaptic neuron, either to inhibit that neuron to keep it from firing an action potential or to excite that neuron and so it fires an action potential. Now, this is a much slower response compared to an electrical synapse. But an electrical synapse, it's useful for getting many cells to operate in unison very quickly. But in the chemical synapse, this actually allows us to utilize and integrate information uh, on a much more complex level, which would be better for a lot of our neuronal processes, okay? Uh, because we don't always want an all or none response with our brain and our interactions in our brain. Right? We want to actually be able to modulate and modify different processes and fine tune them. And this chemical synapses will allow for that, okay? Uh, because we don't always have one simple connection to a neuron to, uh, as you know, one neuron connects to another neuron, you may have a hundred neurons connecting to one neuron. Okay, so this can become quite uh, quite complex. Now, in terms of the synapses, where they synapse, most of the synapses are going to occur on the dendrites of another neuron. Okay, so what they've drawn over here is a little line there to show that. So you can see that we have what we call an axodendritic synapse. The axon of our presynaptic neuron is connecting with the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. That's one of the most common. The other very common one is the axosomatic. Soma is the body of the cell, so the axon is connecting with the soma. And then in some other instances, you will have what we call axo-axonic, where the axon actually makes a synapse with an axon. And that plays like another modulatory role. In addition, we have something we call our local potentials. All right, uh, remember I had mentioned things like a graded potential where locally that can increase uh, or decrease the, the potential of that neuron, either bringing it further away from firing an action potential or bringing it closer to it. And so if it brings it closer to firing that action potential, we refer to that as an EPSP or an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Okay, it's excitatory because we're gonna get it to closer to firing an action potential. In other words, we're depolarizing that uh, postsynaptic neuron. So for example, if this is my postsynaptic neuron cell body, our, if you recall, negative 70 millivolts is the average resting membrane potential. So depolarizing it means we bring it closer to zero. So it will be negative, six, negative 70 to say negative 60 or 50 and so on. If on the other hand, that postsynaptic neuron gets inputs that bring it further away from threshold for firing an action potential, we refer to that as an IPSP or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And then we refer to that as hyperpolarizing. We go from negative 70 to negative 80. So we're even further from that threshold potential for firing an action potential. Okay. And um, so what you're seeing here in the, in the cartoon is let's say we have some sort of receptor that was, that's generating uh, some type of potential. All right. That signal is then transmitted to our interneuron there in the spinal cord. And at that interneuron, when it communicates with it, it's exciting that interneuron. So therefore, that's an EPSP, meaning that it's releasing a neurotransmitter that's causing the interneuron that's there to depolarize. Okay, so we call that an EPSP. Now, the interneuron, when it interacts with the motor neuron right here at that synapse, it's another chemical synapse. When it releases neurotransmitter, it's causing that neurotransmitter to say, uh, depolarize it, and if it depolarizes it, then therefore it would be referred to as an, uh, an EPSP. But on the other hand, that interneuron may also inhibit that motor neuron. If it inhibits it or it hyperpolarizes it, we call that an IPSP. And just to give you an example, some reflexes are going to uh, excite a muscle and as well as inhibit certain muscles. 
to help coordinate the, the motion. Uh, for example, the patellar knee reflex. When you strike the, the knee, okay, remember we kick out. Well, the kick out motion is because we're exciting and contracting the quadricep muscles. Okay, but at the same time, we also have to inhibit the antagonist muscles, which would be the hamstring muscles. So, at, so that reflex excites the quadriceps, so that would be an EPSP, and it would inhibit the hamstring muscles because inhibiting a muscle would cause it to relax. Okay, so we inhibit the muscle, and that would be an IPSP. So we have both an, an excitation and an inhibition, an EPSP and an IPSP. And again, a postsynaptic neuron, as I've noted at the bottom, can receive many signals at once. So it could, in fact, receive, uh, a single neuron could receive both an EPSP and an IPSP at the same time. Okay, so let me see if I can illustrate the same point using those diagrams from the previous slide. So let's say I have my neuron. Okay, and again, that's, the, the cell body is the circle over there, right? And it has its axon and then the axon terminal, which is that little triangle. And let's say I have another neuron here. So I'm gonna label this one as neuron one, and this is neuron two. And so when neuron one is communicating with neuron two, neuron one is the presynaptic neuron. That would make neuron two the postsynaptic neuron. Now, if, if neuron one, when it communicates right, and releases its neurotransmitter in that synapse there to neuron 2, if it causes neuron 2 to fire an action potential, all right, then that means the connection there that is creating an EPSP in our postsynaptic neuron, or it's creating an EPSP in neuron 2, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. All right, that means that, that negative 70 millivolts inside neuron 2 there is going to become negative 60 or negative 50, it may or may not fire an action potential, but what we're just saying is it's depolarizing it. We're not saying that it's an absolute going to fire an action potential, but it's gonna help bring it closer to firing an action potential. So because it's doing that, we refer to it as an EPSP. That just means the graded potential is depolarizing the postsynaptic cell, or the postsynaptic neuron. So therefore it's an, e, uh, an EPSP. And again, of course, on the other hand, if it were to inhibit or hyperpolarize uh, neuron number two, then in fact it would be um, it would be considered uh, an IPSP, and it's keeping neuron number two from actually firing. And this this of course will be utilized throughout the brain, spinal cord, and uh, in order to help to integrate and modulate um, different types of inputs. Now, as I mentioned before, we could have multiple neurons communicating with the same with the same neuron. Now in this example really I'll, I'll label this three oops I'll label this one as three and this one as four. You'll notice that neurons three and four and one I'm just kind of drawing it as synapsing on the soma of there so that would be an axosomatic uh, synapse. I'm just not drawing the dendrites in right now. Now in this case, let's say I have one is, axon one is causing an EPSP in the postsynaptic. So I'm just going to call that an EPSP. And I apologize about my handwriting right now. My stylus just broke, so I'm writing this with my fingers. All right, and let's say four is also an EPSP. And we'll say three is an IPSP. So this is what I was, I was pointing out at the very end of the last slide was that I have three different neurons communicating with neuron number two. And two of them are giving an EPSP. All right, so those can both give excitatory inputs. And whether or not it's an EPSP or an IPSP by a, a neuron, so for example, if one excites neuron two, it will, its job will always be to excite neuron two. It can't switch between releasing neurotransmitter that causes inhibition and neurotransmitter that causes excitation of neuron two. It'll always release the same neurotransmitter and that will always cause either excitation or inhibition, but not both. It doesn't switch. Okay, so if I'm labeling one as a, you know causing an EPSP and two, it will always do that. Four will always do that. One will always do, or excuse me, three will always do that. Three releases an IPSP, so its job will always be to inhibit neuron two.
So it becomes a game of numbers, right? If I have one and four are causing excitation and three is causing inhibition, okay? It's a matter of, you know, does the excitation outweigh the inhibition in terms of its inputs? And that's going to depend on how many IPSP inputs it's getting versus how many EPSP inputs. All right, so if I get a depolarizing stimulus that depolarizes to, say, uh, from negative 70 to, say, negative uh, 65, so it's slightly depolarized, the IPSP uh, inputs, let's say it's happening simultaneously, the IPSP inputs could be uh, driving it to, say, negative 80, uh, which would be a much stronger drive, and we're going to end up with some average in between there that is slightly hyperpolarized, so the IPSPs could win out. So it all really depends on, on which, which input is more, more frequent or abundant at the time. Okay, so in terms of the, the structure of these chemical synapses, if we just look closely here, you can see the two neurons on, on the other side there. And you can point it out over here. You can see the cartoon that we have a synapse between two neurons. All right, so this this is synapsing and you'll, you'll notice that that makes this what we're looking at right here that's the presynaptic uh, what we call the synaptic knob or the uh, the end bulb there and so that's coming from the presynaptic neuron and then that means down here in this region right there that's the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron that is receiving that information okay so now you'll notice that uh, the presynaptic, as it communicates there, is releasing these vesicle filled with neurotransmitter. And as I mentioned before in the previous slide, that will always be the same transmitter, whether it's glutamate, GABA, glycine, and so on. There's a, a whole bunch of different types uh, that will act with, you know, a host of different receptors. So what happens here is this. We have an axon, uh, excuse me, the, the axon is transmitting the nerve impulse or the action potential. We'll say that's our action potential. Uh, is traveling down the axon there and it gets to this terminal what happens at the terminal is that it causes the release of those vesicles filled with neurotransmitter to fuse with the, mem the plasma membrane and to release their contents into what we call the synaptic cleft which is that little space between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron and then they diffuse across that synapse and they'll combine with the uh, receptor on the postsynaptic neuron's membrane. And when it binds to it, again, depending on what that interaction is, if it's an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter, uh, let's say it's acetylcholine, and acetylcholine binds to it, opens up a channel that causes depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron, uh, then we have an EPSP, right? On the other hand, it could be something like glycine or GABA, which are very common inhibitory neurotransmitters. And what they would do is they bind to a receptor and it would cause hyperpolarization. All right. Now you can also see the same thing at what we call the neuromuscular junction, which I've shown you a picture of over here. All right. And in fact, at this region right here is where you have an axon that's interacting with a single skeletal muscle cell. In fact, this entire cylindrical shaped structure right there is a skeletal muscle cell. And so it can interact with there and cause uh, excitation of the, the muscle and cause contraction. Now, a little bit more specifically about what's occurring at that synaptic site. So again, we're talking about communication between two neurons. Here you can see an axodendritic synapse. We zoom in on that. You can see our presynaptic and postsynaptic portions there. And you'll see it at site one right here, the nerve impulse, otherwise known as our action potential, has traveled down the axon. And as it gets to that point, I told you that it releases uh, vesicles filled with neurotransmitter. They're going to fuse to the membrane. So specifically what's happening now is as we depolarize this portion of the axon, as the action potential is making its way down, that's actually going to activate these voltage-gated calcium channels. And these are absolutely essential. So activation of these voltage-gated calcium channels, they're going to open up, all right, based on the depolarization from the action potential. And calcium, which is in higher concentrations outside the cell, is going to go down its concentration gradient into the into the uh, synaptic terminal there when it diffuses in that's going to trigger the vesicles to fuse with the membrane and release neurotransmitter if there is no calcium coming in at the terminal 
the neurotransmitter will not be released. So calcium is absolutely essential for releasing the neurotransmitter. So they'll fuse, they release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, it diffuses across and binds to the postsynaptic uh, channels. So these are ligand gated because the ligand is a neurotransmitter, binds to the receptor there, and it opens up a channel. And again, that channel, depending on what the ion is, will either hyperpolarize or depolarize. Now, in addition, we also to releasing the neurotransmitter, we also have to make sure that we uh, remove the neurotransmitter. And so the orange box there is describing the various ways in which we can remove it. So it either diffuses away from that, that cleft, like goes further and further out, just diffuses out into the uh, extracellular fluid there, or it gets taken up by the presynaptic neuron again. So it recycles, it takes it back up, uh, and, uh, and or it can be you know, enzymatically degraded. So in the synaptic cleft itself, in that extracellular matrix there, you could have um, embedded in that matrix, you could have enzymes that are that are there in that synaptic cleft that will actually degrade the, the neurotransmitter. So a classic example of that is acetylcholinesterase. It's one you're going to see a lot of. Acetylcholinesterase, as the name suggests, is going to actually break down acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. This keeps it from overactivating those, uh, those receptors. Okay, or overexciting those receptors. Uh, it's classically found in something like the neuromuscular junction where the neuron communicates with the skeletal muscle. That always releases acetylcholine. And so in that synaptic cleft, it would have acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase's job would be to break it up, at which point, once it degrades it, it will stop signaling, and then maybe the presynaptic uh, terminal can then take that back up and recycle it and uh, reuse it and restore it into those vesicles to be used again. Now, the, this piece here uh, is just to, to help you guys to see and appreciate uh, the level of modulation that can occur with these chemical synapses. So, for example, you can see um, in example A here, we have what we call presynaptic inhibition. So, this is, uh, pre, we call this presynaptic modulation. So imagine here, here's my neuron, all right, here's my cell body of my neuron, this is the axon, you can see the action potential is traveling down the axon, and then the axon itself divides, and it's acting on, say, three different tissues or target cells, for example, all right. Now, normally once the axon gets down there, it divides, every single one of those terminals is going to release their, their neurotransmitter. However, we can also modulate that response a little bit. So we'll look at note number three over here. We can modulate the presynaptic release there. In other words, as we know as the action potential reaches the terminal, it's going to activate voltage-gated calcium channels. Those voltage-gated calcium channels are going to let an influx of calcium in to release neurotransmitter. So this presynaptic, so this is a, an axoaxonic synapse, which is the one I told you is not as common. This axoaxonic synapse, this is, you see the negative sign in it, is going to cause inhibition of the presynaptic terminal. In other words, it's going to inhibit the activation of voltage-gated calcium channels in the presynaptic terminal there. If I inhibit the voltage-gated calcium channels, as I mentioned before, without calcium, there's no uh, neurotransmitter release. So it is just locally inhibiting the action of that voltage-gated calcium channel by changing its potential there. The result will be the release of no transmitter or no response. So it just locally inhibited there. Whereas the other branches, which are not affected by that uh, inhibitory neuron, there you get a, a response in both those cells because it's not inhibiting those presynaptic uh, terminals. So I can fine tune and modulate and only activate certain cells rather than some others. All right, which can be very useful for our body in terms of you know uh, fine tuning certain responses. The difference here is that if I, in part B, is if I have presynaptic uh, or I have inhibition of the soma, for example, if I have inhibition taking place at the cell body as opposed to the presynaptic terminal, what that's going to do is it's going to inhibit that neuron from firing an action potential at all, which means if there's no action potential, that means every single one of these sites down here, none of them are going to be activated because I'm, I'm stopping action potentials at the source. All right, so that's sort of a, a gross way of inhibiting all actions of a neuron so that there's no response to any of the cells. Whereas in the previous example, I can just inhibit the terminal and I can then modulate or fine tune the response so some cells will respond and others will not.
this is something as you know we get to the end of the semester we'll talk about pain uh, this is one way in which we can kind of modify uh, pain responses and, and different types of sensation responses so that they don't kind of cross over with one another um, so spatial and temp uh, temporal uh, summation has to do with the, the signaling to the postsynaptic neuron. So I told you that multiple presynaptic neurons can synapse on the same postsynaptic neuron. So for example, you can see up here, uh, I have the two blue presynaptic ones, and then the third one, which is the uh, postsynaptic neuron, which is colored red. And so I could have you know neuron one and two. If one fires, right? So here's a graph of the action potential itself. So Let's say one just fired. I'm going to circle it down there. I get a little stimulus there. You see the resting memory potential is at negative 70. There's a little blip, so it's a graded potential coming from neuron one. And then let's say it goes back to baseline because enough time has elapsed. And then neuron two fires, and you'll see another a little graded potential blip right there. All right, it's not strong enough to reach threshold. All right, and then a little bit of time has elapsed. Now, what if both one and two fire simultaneously? So they release at the same time. And so that's what it means by many. So in this example, it's just showing two, but this could be you know, tens or hundreds of neurons firing at the same time. I would reach threshold very rapidly. It would look nice and smooth and reach threshold almost immediately because it's happening simultaneously. And that would drive the, uh, the potential towards threshold quickly, and I would fire an action potential. So we call that spatial summation, where the, the the EPSP coming from one and two have now combined to reach threshold. All right, so it's happening spatially from different neurons. All right, so we refer to that as spatially. So it's occurring in different parts, uh, or it's coming from uh, the signal is coming from two different neurons, which are synapsing in two different sites on the postsynaptic neuron. So we refer to it as spatial summation. All right. Now in temporal summation, it's a little bit different. We're just seeing one presynaptic neuron. So it has only to do with one neuron. And if that one neuron again just fires once, you might see a little greater potential again. There's enough time elapsed, and so it went back to baseline. We fire again, and the same thing happens. However, if we increase the frequency of firing of that one neuron, which you see here with the multiple arrows, you can see a stepwise progression to the threshold. In other words, it's fired, it's released its neurotransmitter, it's excited the postsynaptic neuron, but not enough to reach threshold. But before that postsynaptic neuron can go back to baseline, another stimulus comes and brings and increases the excitation again. And so we get summation, which is something I had referred to in the, the previous lecture. And you can see it more like a stepwise progression. So that has to do with frequent firing from one neuron. So we have both what we call spatial, which is many neurons firing simultaneously causing you know, the, the activation, or one neuron firing very frequently. The reality is we don't have one or the other, we often have combinations of both, where many neurons are firing at different frequencies, all signaling a particular neuron. So it can become quite complex, and it really comes down to a numbers game, which one is ultimately winning out, uh, especially when it, when it comes to you know saying it's an IPSP versus an EPSP. right? In this example that I've given here, these are all EPSPs because all of them are causing uh, excitation and bringing it to an action potential. But you could just as easily have a neuron, an inhibitory neuron, causing IPSPs in the postsynaptic neuron and firing very frequently and driving it and hyperpolarizing it more and more. So again, this is all about sort of integrating all those, all that information, and the postsynaptic neurons will then either fire or not fire depending on the outcome. And here's the, a specific synapse. This is called the neuromuscular junction. Sometimes shorthand is called the NMJ. All right. And we refer to these the potentials that occur between a neuron and a skeletal muscle as like the end plate potential or the EPP. And so you can see up here the, what we call the neuron that connects with a skeletal muscle. We refer to it as a somatic motor neuron. Okay. Uh, these are very large motor neurons. And it's connecting here. This entire structure right here is uh, one uh, skeletal muscle. And we'll get into the anatomy of that in the skeletal muscle lecture. If we zoom in on this synapse down here, you can see it right over here. Same principle though, action potential comes down, calcium comes in, vesicular release of the neurotransmitter. In this case, at the neuromuscular junction, the neurotransmitter that is released is always acetylcholine. All right, so it's going to release acetylcholine. 
acetylcholine crosses through the synaptic cleft there and then binds to what we call the motor end plate on the skeletal muscle. All right, it kind of looks like a plate and it has, you see, these grooves in it. And as I mentioned before earlier in this lecture, that's really to increase surface area. All right, and then you can embed more of the acetylcholine receptors so that they can bind to the acetylcholine that's being released and, of course, open up an ion channel. And in this case, it's always excitatory. So anytime acetylcholine is released from a somatic motor neuron, it will always excite the skeletal muscle to contract. All right. Then again, we're zooming in close, closer to that synapse there, and you can see the acetylcholine, all right, acetylcholine binding to the acetylcholine receptors and allowing things like sodium in to help depolarize the membrane of the skeletal muscle. And again, the skeletal muscle is going to have its own membrane potential. Once we depolarize it, it's going to cause or result in a, a contraction of that muscle. Okay, here I've labeled the motor end plate for you, and that's our synaptic end bulb, which is part of the presynaptic uh, neuron. And you see the acetylcholine being released right there. Okay, so that's again always going to be excitatory on the muscle if it's released. A clinical correlate to this uh, at the neuromuscular junction is something called myasthenia gravis, which you may have heard of. This is basically an autoimmune disorder that blocks or destroys uh, the acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction. Now, I want to point out here, I've, I've labeled it specifically nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And in fact, at the neuromuscular junction, where the neuron connects with the skeletal muscle, it always releases acetylcholine, and the receptor that the acetylcholine binds to is always nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Named so because it combined with nicotine, like the nicotine from cigarettes. But that's very specific and something I'm going to come back to, so we need to remember that. All right. So in this case, the autoimmune disorder blocks or destroys those receptors. So although the neurotransmitter is present, there's not a lot of receptors there, and so we may not get a good depolarization, and it can ultimately result in weakness. Um, the muscle is just not contracting all that well. And so you can see in this child over here, um, one of the signs you might see in someone with myasthenia gravis is that their eyelids, they have a hard time keeping their eyelids open, and they might start to drop a little bit, and you can see this, and we refer to this as ptosis. There are other disorders that have ptosis as well. It's not just myasthenia gravis, but that's one of the characteristics you can see. To treat this, though, logically, all right, um, we don't have a whole lot of receptors there. However, if I can keep the amount of neurotransmitter present in the synaptic cleft a little bit longer, then the you know, the receptors that are there, I can activate for longer and maybe, you know, elicit a better contraction um, and increase the strength. So we treat with what we call neostigmine and pyridostigmine, which I'm sure you guys will go over in pharmacology. All right, but the, the role of neostigmine, for example, is it actually blocks or inhibits the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. And if you recall, acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine in the cleft. So if I inhibit that enzyme from breaking it down, that means acetylcholine will be present for longer in the synaptic cleft and activate the receptors that are present for longer periods of time, thus improving strength. We also have some other drugs that affect synaptic release. Things that you may have noticed uh, or you may be familiar with, like a local anesthetic, like the canes, I call them. Right? We have like lidocaine, novocaine. Often these are, you know, used superficially to numb the skin, for example. Uh, dentists like to use like the Novocaine. Lidocaine can, you know, give it a little anesthesia uh, locally on the skin. We also use lidocaine for certain arrhythmias of the heart, actually. But their function is to block voltage-gated sodium channels. And if you recall, the depolarization that occurs in the action potential is carried out by voltage-gated sodium channels. So at certain doses, or low doses, we can actually specifically inhibit voltage-gated sodium channels in pain neurons. So therefore, we're inhibiting the pain, uh, the, the, the transmission of pain neurons. So they don't fire action potentials and we perceive no pain. Botulinum toxin, or Botox. You know, you guys may be familiar with that term as well. That's what the picture on the right is kind of showing you there, which, you know, uh, people have used, of course, for aesthetic uh, purposes, to get rid of wrinkles, uh, reduce the look of aging in the skin, and so on. Uh, but it has many, many uses. So, for example, Botox is actually also used to help people with 
uh, migraines, like very severe migraines, uh, or painful contractures of their muscles, say from you know a previous stroke or something, to help relax the muscles so that they can move again. Because strongly contracted muscles for prolonged periods of time can be very painful. So its mechanism is it blocks the release of the neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction. So in other words, it blocks the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. That will weaken the uh, the muscle. All right. So it, it inhibits its ability to do that, and the muscle will, will relax. Okay, because it's not being excited anymore. Uh, the tetanus toxin. Now, the tetanus toxin uh, that blocks release of GABA and glycine. GABA and glycine, as I've mentioned, are primary inhibitory neurotransmitters. So they tend to block neurons from firing action potentials. And uh, if we block the release of GABA and glycine from inhibitory neurons, that means the inhibitory neuron is unable to inhibit other neurons. Okay, it's unable to inhibit certain neurons. And we need them to because, again, there's a whole lot of modulation that goes with excitation and in, in inhibition. What ends up happening is uh, we overexcite because we're not, we don't have as much inhibitory drive anymore. And when you overexcite, that can result in things like increased activation of skeletal muscles that should be inhibited. And it can cause them to kind of contract and hold. Uh, and again, if that happens to the diaphragm, for example, it could stop breathing. So it can become very dangerous. Drugs that affect uh, synaptic responses. We also have antidepressants. Okay, the mechanism of action, just briefly, is to prevent the reuptake of neurotransmitter in some of them. So, for example, like an SSRI, which is you know serotonin reuptake inhibitor. When a neuron releases serotonin, uh, if you block its reuptake, you leave it in the synapse longer, and it can activate those serotonin receptors. Uh, and it, they found that it helps with things like uh, depression, for example. And so actually that's what the, the cartoon over here is showing you is that the neurotransmitter is being released, right? If you take, for example, a tricyclic antidepressant and you block the presynaptic reuptake of that neurotransmitter, you leave it in the cleft for a little bit longer and it can activate those receptors because what they found is that in some uh, depressed patients that there is a low level of neurotransmitter there. Benzodiazepines, all right, usually often used for things like anxiety, they enhance inhibitory neurotransmitter of GABA in the brain. So that can actually suppress a lot of uh, activation of the neurons and overall can, they found that it can also reduce um, anxiety and panic attacks and so on by increasing the over, uh, overall inhibition in the brain. And lastly, I just want to touch on neurogenesis in the central nervous system. Uh, just as an important point clinically is that in the central nervous system, there's little or no repair when it's been damaged. So, you know, no repair after, say, like a, a stroke or a head injury. Um, because what you have is inhibitory influences coming from the neuroglia. As supportive as the neuroglia are, uh, the oligodendrocytes in particular can actually inhibit the regrowth of, say, axons that have been sheared or damaged from head injury. Uh, and remember, oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system. Uh, it's not necessarily always the case in the peripheral. The peripheral can sometimes regenerate, although it can be very slow. The absence of any growth stimulating clues that were present during fetal development. Okay, we had a lot of growth stimulating clues for development, and when they're absent, of course, it's difficult to regenerate and, and to grow, and we generally uh, just lose ne neurons as we age. And there's also rapid formation of scar tissue. And again, this is really in part due to the neuroglia and what it does is it kind of fills in the gaps from the damage there and, and produces scar tissue very rapidly. And that also contributes to the inhibition of repair because as you fill it up with scar tissue, you're unable to actually let the uh, neurons regrow into that, that tissue any longer. All right, so uh, I will, of course, meet you guys on Zoom and we'll go over any questions that you guys have. Take care.